All right, so um, so today we are going to be uh, taking kind of a couple of steps back and, and maybe out, and uh, we're just going to talk about sort of models in general, uh, some model theory. We're going to talk about predictions, um, particularly with, with reference to, to fire science, um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about some of our new generation uh, physical fire models, uh, particularly WFDS, the Wildland Fire Dynamics Simulator, uh, the model that, that I work with in, in my research. Um, and there's also uh, going to be an associated video, video lecture from uh, Dr. Rod Lin, um, who, who works with a, a similar physics-based model called FireTech. Um, so I'll have that, that link posted and, and make sure to check out his, his lecture um, uh, as well on, on fire tech and, and specifically applications to, um, to how we understand fire behavior, and how we think about um, things like prescribed fire and interactions between fire lines and, and how our, our physical models can help us in, uh, in better understanding those, those, those processes. So the, the first question we're gonna we're gonna ask and, and answer here is is what is a model, um, right? And so so basically you know a model is is really anything that that's used to to represent something other than itself, right? So so some models are are just physical objects, right? A, a scale model of you know an airplane or a car or a boat or something like that, right? It it it's a physical representation of of a, a real world object. Um, it may even be able to to do some of the functions as the object it's it's representing, um, right? But it but it's still just a representation of of that actual object. Um, you can also have a, a conceptual model, right? This is something that that's kind of in our head, um, you know, our, our own ideas about how a system is going to behave, um, that sort of thing. And then there are also mathematical models, uh, which is what we've we've been dealing with in this class, right? So it's it's basically just a system where we we use mathematical equations to to describe um, some some system in the real world, um, and and then use that those mathematical equations to maybe make some predictions about how the system would be expected to behave, right? Given some set of uh, initial conditions, you know, our mathematical model can then go ahead and 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 make some predictions uh, about what the potential outcomes are going to be. In, in all cases, models are a simplification of reality. Um, you may have heard the, the phrase, right, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, and the idea there is that, you know, we, we can't completely represent the, the whole system, right? In our case, the, the system is, is nature or, in, you know, in fire, this sort of complex three-dimensional physical process of fire. Um, we, can't, we can't model every single aspect of that. There, there are lots of simplifications we have to make. Um, and, and ultimately, it's down to, to us to decide if, if our model is actually useful, or, or maybe we've, we've simplified the system down to the point where um, our model is, is, is not, in fact, useful. Um, so, so some examples of common models in, in natural resources, and, and particularly fire, uh, some of these we've seen, right? We've got fuel models that are uh, just a sort of numerical representation of our complex three-dimensional fuel complex. Um, we've seen Rothermel's surface fire spread model, and uh, and hopefully some of you have have some experience working with the forest vegetation sim simulator in in other classes. Um, and this is a, a forest uh, forest growth model that can um, you know you you can basically project into time how your forest is going to grow and develop uh, based on you know the current conditions, and then either uh, no management action or, or particular uh, silvicultural prescriptions, um, how those are going to affect growth moving forward. Um, but right in all cases, these are simplifications of reality um, that, that we just have to make in order to, uh, to develop uh, predictions about the future. So thus far in, in class, we've really focused on using uh, models, right? In our case, simple uh, fire spread models to make uh, predictions about some future outcome um, or future state of, of our system. Um, but there are some other model uses, right? One big one um, is, is this idea of synthesis or understanding, right? Where we, we can use a model to, to better understand how our system is behaving, um, particularly uh, 
um, you know, how, how strongly is the outcome dependent on particular uh, starting conditions or, or particular parameters that, that we find this model is really sensitive to. Um, and, and maybe that will, will give us some deeper understanding on, on how the system actually works. Um, and so, so, so this kind of idea of, of synthesis or um, trying to just develop a better idea of, of, of how a system actually works through modeling um, is, is, a, is a major use that, that we haven't touched too much on because um, we've been more focused on uh, making specific predictions about potential fire behavior. So somewhat related to this idea of synthesis, right? There are a few other secondary or, um, you know, secondary uses of, of models. Um, you know, sometimes they can help us identify areas that, that we don't understand. We don't, maybe we don't know physically why a system is behaving in a particular way. Um, you know, they might give us a surprising result. And uh, they also can help design new hypotheses and experiments um, that we can then go out in the real world and, and see if, you know, this behavior that we're identifying in the model um, is, is actually, you know, existing and, and occurring in our, our real world system. Um, I've got some pictures of kind of an example of this where, um, you know, thinking about physically how fire spread, uh, you know, how fire spread and, and propagate, um, there's, there's sort of this emergent behavior that, that you, you know, if you've been on a fire, um, you know, maybe you've observed where there's sort of these peaks and troughs where, where there are bits of the flame that are higher and, and bits that are lower. Um, and, and sometimes you get these sort of um, streaks of fire, you know, you can see in that, that simulation there on the left, kind of behind the fire line. Um, and a lot of this behavior is actually really important to how the heat transfer occurs and how fires spread and, and propagate. Um, and it, it's something that is actually an emergent property of these models when we when we start linking together all these uh, physical equations, um, some of this real fire behavior that um, you know maybe wasn't seen to be important or, or really well understood actually just jumps out of the model um, sort of just as a um, you know sort of sort of unexpected result of of trying to model the physics we we start to make these new um, inferences about how how fires behave and, and move um, and and that's that's something modeling can uh, can kind of surprise us with in terms of uh, you know how we classify or, or differentiate models you know there are a lot of different ways we can we can classify models some of which we've seen and, and we'll talk about in more detail um, as this lecture moves along but um, really two of the most important things to think about are you know what what type of model is this and and what is its purpose you know what what is uh it, it trying to do for us um and, and whenever you're using a model you really need to be aware of of its purpose and, and particularly why it was developed um that can help guide you in uh, both its use and and maybe whether you decide if if the model is really applicable or, or should be used to uh to answer the particular question um that you're hoping to to use it for so, so thinking specifically about wildland fire models, um, you know, there's a lot of different types. Um, we've been looking at at, at Rothermel's surface fire model, right, which is is a collection of mathematical equations that that give us a, a particular solution when you solve them. Um, but you know, models can also refer to something like a fuel model, right, which is really just a list of numbers that describe the natural world. There's no um, there's no real mathematical equations or, or predictions going on. Um, it's it's just sort of a, a set of uh, parameters that that describe our um, our, our fuel structure, um, and then we also use the term model a little generally when we're thinking about talking about you know what what are maybe called decision support systems. Um, for example, Behave is one of these systems where uh, we call it a model, but it's it's really a whole bunch of models packaged together. Um, so, you know, it, it is a model, but it's it's also got a bunch of sub models within it um, that, that all have sort of different uh, different origins and, and, and different specific purposes and, and even, um, you know, are, are different types of models uh, within this larger umbrella of, of behave. Um, and then, you know, in Wildland Fire, we also rely on, on mental models or, or what could just be thought of as experience. Um, and that's just the case of, 
you know, as you build your 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 experience out in the in the real world observing fires, um, you know, you'll come to expect certain behaviors, or or you know, you you might say, hmm, I, I've seen a, a situation that looked like this before, and um, you know, I have some idea of, of how the fire is going to behave when it, um, you know, when it gets here or, or when it encounters these these weather or fuel conditions. Um, so you you build up these mental models. Uh, as you go, just just based on your past experience, um, and and these are really useful, and and you know it's probably the most important model you're ever going to have when you're when you're actually out in the field or, or on a fire line directly is is your mental models that you've built through experience. So these really important uh, mental models or or this type of model has been described as it is a deeply ingrained assumptions, generalizations, or even pictures. All right, so mental pictures that influence how we understand the world and how we take action. Um, so, you know, they can be very useful. Uh, we do need to be careful with them because, uh, you know, sometimes unexpected behaviors can occur. And if we're really ingrained in, in our idea of the world and, and how we think fire behaves or, or how we think a particular fire is going to behave, um, sometimes we could put ourselves in a, a dangerous situation, maybe without even realizing it, um, because we've become a little too... Uh, you know, we've built up maybe a little too much faith in our own mental model. Um, so we just need to, to take care when we're uh, when we're acting out there to, to understand that just because something, you know, worked one way in the past, um, you know, it, it, there might be some tiny little piece of the system that's that's different and, and you didn't notice it or it wasn't captured in your mental model. And um, that could result in a, a drastic change in, in fire behavior. Um, which which could cause a, a dangerous situation, right? So we just need to um, be flexible in, in in our understanding of the world, and, and that it's it's incomplete. All right. So these these mental models are are incomplete. They're they're going to be constantly evolving as you build experience, as you see new situations. Um, you know, they're not necessarily accurate representations, and and uh, you know, there may be errors or contradictions in, in the way you're, you're thinking about things. Uh, they're, they're extremely simplified explanations of, you know, what's, what's actually, in a, a, you know, a highly complex system um, in terms of fire behavior. And, uh, you know, you might have some idea of your, your uncertainty and, and, and uh, you know, how, basically how sure you are that the fire is going to behave the way you think, um, but you may go ahead and, and, and use your model anyway. So, um, you just got to be, be, be cautious, right? And, uh, and, and make sure you're not really overstepping and, and you certainly wouldn't want to put yourself in a dangerous situation based on, um, sort of an incomplete understanding of, of what might, may or may not happen. So moving on from our, our mental models, we have, um, we've got our, our mathematical models, right? And, and mathematical models are, are basically just, um, an equation or, or a group of equations that that are used together to make uh, predictions. We've uh, we've seen some of these so far. Um, there are really three main classifications used to to separate mathematical models. Um, so one are, are theoretical or, or physical or, or physics based models, um, and these are the the models that use um, you know, uh, not complete, but uh, as complete as possible uh, understanding of the actual physics and the equations that, that underlie that physics to um, to try and make uh, basically really complex, spatially explicit predictions. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, we also have our empirical models, which is uh, basically just, you know, correlations between um, maybe some environmental and fuel characteristics and expected fire behavior. Um, so one of the, you know, one kind of empirical model we've seen is Rothermel's uh, crown fire rate of spread model. Um, this is a, a purely empirical model because it's, it's just a correlation between the observed spread rate and um, a, uh, a, a predicted spread rate from, from a different model. So, so it's just this, this relationship that was identified um, but there's no there's no attempt at all of of actually calculating the heat transfer or the physics or, or really anything that's going on. It's just uh, a correlation based on observations. Um, and then we have semi-empirical models, which would be uh, Rothermel's surface fire model. 
Um, and this is called a semi-empirical model because there are some aspects of this model that are attempting to uh, you know, basically simulate and account for the, the physical processes of, of heat transfer. Um, and then there are other pieces of the model that are just pure correlations uh, derived through, um, in, in this case, mostly laboratory uh, experiments, a little bit of field, field work too, but mostly laboratory experiments to, um, to develop some of these correlations. Um, you know, like for example, our wind and, and slope factors. Um, so, so the semi-empirical model is kind of halfway in between where we're using some physics and some empiricism to, to build our model. So a little bit more about the, the theoretical models or, or, you know, recently they're, they're most often referred to as, as physics-based models. Um, so, so these are models that are generated from the, the laws that govern fluid mechanics uh, combustion and heat transfer. Um, you know, they're, they're difficult to verify um, because they are so complex and, and um, are trying to capture all these three-dimensional aspects of, of fire behavior and, and the fire environment uh, simultaneously. So it's, it's really hard to do good, uh, good experimentation to, to truly understand uh, how well they're capturing the system. Um, but a big benefit of this type of model is we can extrapolate them to a wide variety of situations um, because, you know, in, in theory, we're, we're actually solving the physics and, and, and truly representing, um, or at least very closely representing a, the, the real world system. Um, so as I mentioned at the top, uh, FireTech and, and WFDS are, are probably two of the most common um, physics-based models being used in fire behavior research, but there's a, there's a whole host of other uh, physics-based models that have developed, been developed, um, you know, here, here in North America, as well as uh, internationally, um, right? They're really just trying to connect these, these complex physics equations to, um, to combustion to, to make really precise predictions about how things are behaving in, in three dimension, three dimensions. On the other end of the spectrum are our um, empirical models. Uh, and as I said, these are basically just statistical correlations that come from um, either experiments, uh, you know, specific experiments, or um, just, just historical studies or, or basically just observations of, of real world fires. Um, and, and theoretically, right, these models are only applicable to the, you know, identical conditions uh, under which the correlation was developed. Um, a lot of times they're they're applied to you know similar situations, um, but you know we we won't have a good idea of how well they're going to work ahead of time. Uh, so so one example is um, in Australia and actually in Canada as well. Uh, their main kind of operational fire models are are purely empirical models that were developed based on on observations and experimentation. Um, so this image here shows you the this fire spread meter that's used in Northern Australia, um, and essentially it's you know it's it's this physical thing that we can just manipulate and we plug in our, our humidity, our, our fuel moisture, uh, you know, a wind speed, some information about the, the grass curing, and and then the vegetation type, and it links these correlations together to just give us a rate of spread, um, right? So clearly there's there's no physics going on here. This is just correlations from um, observations from from fires in these different ecosystem types or, or vegetation types under various um, environmental conditions, right? So this is a really simple and, and fast way, and it's really convenient because you can just, you know, do this in the field in a, in, in a matter of minutes, and it'll give you a prediction. Um, and how well that prediction, you know, represents reality is, is going to depend on how closely your actual situation is to, uh, to write the situation under which the correlation was was developed, um, so definitely need to use a little bit of care here. Um, but uh, you know they they have had had success with using these types of models uh, in particular uh, suppression capacity. Um, but they're they're far simpler than uh, than even Rothermel's model is is a much simpler approach. And finally, we've got uh, here smack in the middle are our semi-empirical models, right? That that have uh, you know, some physics and heat transfer um, built into them, right? Some equations to, to actually physically predict those things um, with the idea being that, that you know, because it's semi-empirical, uh, 
Um, it, it could be a, extrapolated maybe a little bit further outside of the, the range of the experimentation. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there, there's obviously care that needs to be done there, but maybe a little bit more extendable than our, our pure empirical models. Um, and, and similar to the theoretical models, right, there, there are difficulties validating these. Um, not, not quite as, as challenging as, as with a, a fully theoretical model, um, you know, but, but certainly, certainly not trivial. So uh, in addition to these, these sort of classifications that we talked about, um, really in terms of the model formulation, um, right, well, how, how is the model, uh, how's the model put together or, or sort of what either math or, or lack of math is underlying it. Um, there are also some different categories of fire models uh, sort of based around what they are predicting. Um, and so for each of these, right, you could have a empirical, semi-empirical, or a, a physical model. Um, but these are these are more categorizing what the the model is going to tell you, right? So there are these fire environment models, um, which we've seen some examples of, right? Uh, so fire environment is is making predictions about um, either the, the fuel type, right, or the fuel model, uh, fuel condition being uh, the moisture content, things like that. Uh, we have weather models that are going to predict our, our winds and our temperatures, um, and then terrain models like a, a you know three-dimensional model that, that gives us our slope, elevation, aspect, etc. Um, and then there are our models for fire characteristics, and, and this is where Rothermel's model uh, falls, and uh, most of the, the discussions we've had are, have been around fire characteristic models. Uh, so, so those are predicting things that occur you know, during the fire. So things like ignition and extinction, um, you know, flame dimensions, rate of spread, uh, those, those sort of um, sort of direct predictions about the, the actual fire behavior. Um, there, are, there are first order fire effects models that, um, you know, model things that are basically happening, you know, immediately or, or within a, a few days of the model and, or the, um, the fire event and that are contained within the site um, at which the fire occurred, right? So things like how much did we, con how much fuel did we consume? How much reduction in the fuel load? Um, you know, soil, um, soil exposure, soil damage, uh, tree mortality, um, all of those things are, are first order fire effects. Um, and then we have our second order fire effects models that are about uh, effects that are, are either removed spatially or temporally from the fire event. Um, right, things like, you know, long distance smoke transport, um, right, how, how much smoke is, is going to end up downwind to some city that's maybe 50 or 100 miles away, um, you know, even health effects related to that smoke, uh, what are the long-term implications for wildlife habitat, economic damage models, um, and then, you know, maybe erosion models, um, so, so things that are occurring either off-site from the actual fire or things that are occurring on site but are, are significantly temporally delayed from the actual fire event uh, all, all fall into this second order fire effects category so just just digging in a little bit more to our fire environment models right so so these models uh, include things like our fire behavior fuel models uh, fuel moisture models uh, which we've seen right the, those tables that we could use to calculate um, fuel moisture based on, uh, you know, weather conditions and, and aspect and that sort of thing uh, are just straight up weather models or weather predictions. Um, and then there are various wind flow models. Uh, I don't have this example of Wind Ninja that can take sort of a high level wind prediction and then uh, turn that into a, a spatial wind prediction that takes into account the effect of, of local topography on uh, surface or, or near surface winds, um, which are really important for fire behavior, right? We, we can have our, our high level wind is maybe blown out of the west, um, but when we get down on the ground, the, the local topography um, is going to significantly affect that. And, uh, and for fire behavior, right, the wind flow that matters is the wind flow that's interacting with the flame, uh, not whatever is happening up at, you know, a couple thousand feet or whatever. Um, so, so we need these wind flow models that can help take it take into account the terrain to make uh, better predictions of our, our, our mid-flame wind speed, right? Or maybe even our, just our 20-foot wind speed. 
Um, and once again, right, we all these models can can have any approach uh, from physical all the way to to empirical. So then quickly, our our, our fire characteristic models um, are, are really about the properties or dynamics of the actual fire itself. So you know, as we've as we've seen a lot, things like rate of spread, fire line intensity, and, and flame length are <coughs> excuse me, probably three of the most um, most common fire characteristics that, that we're interested in, um, right? So these types of models include our fire spread models or, or models about the fire properties. Um, so things like flame length. So we've seen a bunch of different flame length models, um, but there are other models that also incorporate more aspects of the flame, like uh, what the flame angle is gonna be depending on the wind speed, how deep is our flame gonna be, uh, things like that. Um, and and so uh, when we start talking about physical models, um, right, a physical model is going to encompass all these different aspects, right? Not just the rate of spread or the fire line intensity, but they're going to give us, you know, everything we could want to know about the flame length and the angle and the size of the flame and, um, you know, how much energy is it releasing, how much energy is it transferring to a tree, um, et cetera. That's, you know, that's all going to get captured in those really complex physical models. In addition to, to thinking about you know, things like flame dimension or, or, or rate of spread, um, we can also just break these up based on, um, you know, what what type of fire, what, what physical system are we modeling, um, right? So there are different characteristic models for surface fire or for crown fire, right? We've seen this with Roth and Mel. Uh, we've got different models for our surface and our crown fire. Uh, we have models for, for spotting, so things like how, how far um, how far might we expect spotting to occur based on our, you know, forest and weather conditions? Uh, models for, for ground fires, so smoldering ground fires, uh, which we haven't really worked with. Um, you know, these are all just different examples of, of some of the, you know, the other fire characteristics we could we could try and model. So just a few examples of, of fire characteristic models. Uh, so obviously, you know, our Rothermel. Uh, 72 surface fire model or 91 crown fire rate of spread model. Uh, we can also link these two together into a, a, a model um, that, that predicts more of the complete system. Um, and then there's also, you know, physical models like uh, like the one Rod Lynn developed in 1997. That's a purely uh, theoretical, you know, physical spread model. As I said, our, our first order fire effects models are are now thinking about, um, you know, rather than the, the fire behavior or, you know, physical aspects of the spread, um, I think about the, the effects it has on our, our ecosystem. So things like fuel consumption, tree mortality, uh, you know, very local air quality at, at the time of the fire. Um, and, and so these are really restricted to um, to the spatial spatial location at which the fire is occurring and um, you know maybe a, a small temporal delay um, but but these are really the immediate effects of the fire and then we've got our our, our longer uh, and, and wider looking second order fire effects models um, that, that can do things like you know maybe modeling uh, our expectations for erosion or, or how um, you know, particular rain events might impact, uh, you know, erosion following a, a large scale fire, um, you know, long range smoke transport, um, how at the, you know, large scale a fire might change wildlife habitat availability, things like water quality, and then even uh, climate change, right? How much, how much carbon is this, uh, this fire putting up into the atmosphere? Um, so yeah, anything that's, that's either occurring off site or uh, with a significant temporal delay would be considered a, a second order fire effect. Um, yeah, so there, there's a lot of different wildland fire modeling systems that, that link together, um, you know, in, in, in some cases, all these different types of models together um, to, to make a, a large number of predictions. Um, so we've got things like Behave, which we have seen, um, or, or Nexus is another, you know, commonly used, um, Fire, um, fire modeling system that, that links together a whole big collection of models um, or the, the fire behavior prediction system. Um, so we're just capturing all these different models that, that predict the you know, various things we might be interested in and, and linking them together into one package um, just, just you know, for, for convenience really.
Uh, and yeah, so as we've seen, right, Behave has got uh, a number of models within it. We've got our Roth ML 72 service model. We've got Van Wagner for a Crown Fire initiation. And then we go back to Roth ML for a Crown Fire spread. Um, there's also a model built in from, from Albini for, for spotting distances and stuff. And then there's a whole bunch of other models for, um, you know, first order fire effects. So things like tree mortality. Um, and then there's also a, um, a model for, for developing how large of a safety zone you might need. Um, and there's actually, a, you know, a number of other models all built into this one system that we can use to make a whole wide range of predictions. Okay, so we've got all these different models and, uh, you know, we want to use them to make predictions. Um, but before we do so, it's, it's important to think about, um, you know, this idea of maybe model validation, right? So, so how, uh, how true is the model, you know? And, and so model, model validation is typically described as um, the process of, of showing that something doesn't have any obvious flaws or de defects um, and that it's supported by the truth. Um, other definitions include that you know, the model reflects the actual real world behavior or that the model is a good representation of the processes occurring within the system. So sort of baked into this definition is that, you know, if something's validated, um, that might mean that we think it's completely correct or it's, it's perfect. Um, but, you know, clearly that's not the case. These are, these are simplifications. Um, and the, you know, you know, famous, philosopher of science called Popper uh, is, you know, argued quite convincingly, right? We, we, we can't ever prove anything. No scientific model or theory um, can ever be proved to be truly and completely right. Uh, we can prove plenty of things wrong, um, but, you know, there, there's no real truth or, or no real certainty that, that we can prove in these simplifications. Um, largely because they're always flaws, right? As we mentioned, these are, are not the actual system. These are representations of the system. Um, they, they, they just can't be perfect. Um, you know, and, and for this reason, it's, uh, it's maybe better to think about model evaluation rather than, than validation, uh, just because, you know, showing something as valid seems to be that uh, we're trying to prove that it's absolutely 100% true. Um, we're really what we, we should be more concerned with is, you know, is it true enough? or does it provide predictions that we can, we can use and are useful? Um, and we could think about that as more of the idea of evaluation, right? Of evaluating whether or not this model um, is producing predictions that are, are good enough for our, our, our system or our question of concern. When we're, uh, we're thinking about model evaluation, you know, it needs to be evaluated in, in the context of, you know, what the purpose of the model is. Um, and, and when we're doing so, really, there are two aspects here. So uh, we need to think about the, the composition. So how were the hypotheses formulated? How was the model actually built? Um, you know, does this make uh, some sort of, you know, physical sense? And then the, the performance of the model. So actually how, um, how useful or, or how, how close do our predictions get to, to providing us something useful for, for its intended task? Um, so once again, the, the point here is that, you know, it's, it doesn't need to be perfect, but it, it needs to prove itself to be good enough or to be useful. Um, so when we're using models, um, you know, the, the key thing is that, you know, any, any good model needs to be open and, and, and uh, transparent about its assumptions, uh, you know, the, the limitations, the, you know, intended uses of the model. Uh, as well as as well as the uncertainties, right? To to give the user a good idea of um, whether or not their use case is proper for this particular model, um, and it should be evaluated within that context of the purpose that it was developed for. Uh, and as as the person using the model, as the person pressing run and then taking these predictions and and doing something with them, um, you know, the onus is really on you to understand the limitations and and to know. Uh, or to be confident that the model is is useful for your particular situation, um, you know it's it's not on the modeler, the the person who created the model to 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 tell you when to use it, um, right? They should lay out all the assumptions and the uncertainties and everything else, and then you as the actual end user need to decide if um, if that's acceptable and if if this is in fact the right model for you to use, um, and and that's why we really emphasize throughout this class, right? All the different assumptions.
and limitations and criticisms, et cetera, uh, of these models we're working with, um, just so you can be aware um, when using and, and trying to make predictions with them, um, you know, whether or not that's a good use or, or whether or not we should particularly believe or, or how strongly we should believe a, a, a specific prediction. So models make predictions. Um, you know, especially in, in our case around fire, right? We're interested in predictions and, and we need to think about what makes a good prediction. Um, so, so one, you know, common way to think about it is just the accuracy, right? How, how close uh, does our prediction conform to the, to the actual event that occurs? Um, there's this kind of interesting example of, of accuracy. Um, so back in the, the 1880s, uh, there were there were tornado forecasters. They made they made predictions about whether or not a tornado would occur on a particular day, um, and so they you know for for a region or a county or, or whatever they would make this prediction. Either there's you know no tornado or a tornado, and uh, those predictions were right 96.6% of the time, um, which seems like a pretty good a pretty good prediction, right? I mean. You know, tor tornadoes are also like fire, a very complex, um, complex occurrence, and 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 difficult to make good predictions about. So, so even in the 80s, they were or 1880s, they were right 96.6% of the time. Uh, so that seems like a pretty good prediction, right? Well, actually, not not really, um, because if they had just predicted no tornado every single day of the year, well. You know they would have been right over 98% of the time, even even better than their their original prediction, right? Because tornadoes are a really rare event, and so we could just predict no tornado, and we're going to be right almost all of the time. Um, so so clearly, you know, accuracy or, or just a comparison um, to to reality um, isn't always enough to tell us if we're making good predictions. Um, so we we just we need some you know improvement over a standard. Right, so in this case, the standard would be, well, if we just predicted no tornado, we would get it right 98% of the time. So, so a good prediction or a good model needs to to give us better accuracy um, than the no model. Um, I'd also like to highlight this idea that um, you know when thinking about predictions, you know they they don't mean a whole lot all by themselves. Um, it's it's really about the the larger context. Um, and you know the larger process surrounding them, um, and and really that our focus needs to be making uh, good decisions based on our predictions, um, and and not so much focused on making good predictions, because uh, if we're not making good decisions based on on our uh, predictions for the future, um, it, it doesn't matter how how accurate our actual prediction is. Uh, so so in the real world, right, there's some different ways we can think about. Um, making a decision or, or whether we've made a good decision um, so we can focus on the procedure you know what steps did we take how how did we go about actually making our decision uh, this is referred to as procedural rationality or we can focus on the the outcome right which is just you know forget how we came to the decision was was it the right decision or not um, and you know oftentimes there's there's some combination of both of these where um, you know we might not be satisfied with with making a good prediction if we made it in a bad way and, and we might not be satisfied with with making a bad prediction um, if we if we went, went about it in in a non-rational way or using a, a, a bad procedure so there's really interesting uh, case study of sort of the impact of predictions and and then how we actually use those predictions in our decision making process um, right and so so this case study is from uh, the 1997 Red River flood, um, and, and basically what what happened here was the the, the um, scientists had had made a prediction that that there was going to be a flood with a crest of 49 feet, uh, with some known error of of 10% around that prediction. Um, this prediction of 49 feet was only two inches higher than the previous record flood, um, which you know the, these towns along the Red River had had sustained damage, but it, you know it wasn't. Um, catastrophic, and so the public and the decision makers heard this prediction of 49 feet, and they they felt relieved. Uh, you know, it was only going to be a little bit higher than than the previous flood that they had uh, they had managed just fine under. Um, but it turned out that the flood crest was on you know the high end of that prediction and uh, came in at 54 feet and and jumped the levees and 
uh, you know, flooded these towns and, and caused two billion dollars of damage. Um, and, and this was really a failure on the, the decision makers who, who basically interpreted the prediction incorrectly um, and, and didn't really understand the, the inherent uncertainties. Um, so it's just highlighting that, you know, we can make a good prediction, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to make a good decision based on it. Um, and, and the point here is that really, you know, there, there's maybe some, some blame to be shared, um, you know, as a, as a scientist or as somebody, you know, using this model and making predictions, uh, we need to be really clear about how we communicate the uncertainties and, and what the risks really are. Because, um, you know, what the scientists said was that the, the flood crest was going to be 49 feet plus this 10% error or this five foot error. Um, and basically this has the potential to be far and away the worst flood on record, right? That's what their prediction was saying is that this this could, could certainly be the worst flood that, that we've ever seen. Um, but that's not what the public or the decision makers heard. Uh, they just heard 49 feet and, um, you know, that's about the same as our previous record. So uh, maybe we don't need to prepare as, as strongly for this because um, we've experienced it before. Um, so we just need to be really, you know, clear about our uncertainties and, and what, uh, you know, just because we predict a particular number, you know, understanding that there's a range of, of realistic values that, that might actually occur uh, in the real world. To, uh, to summarize here, so, so we use models all the time, right? We're using models um, throughout our daily lives um, for, for all sorts of different purposes. Um, we've got different categories of mathematical models and then different categories of fire models, depending on what they're predicting. And, and, and really, we just need to be very cognizant, right, of these limitations, assumptions, um, and, and whether a particular model is, is going to help answer the question you are interested in. Um, and then also, you know, the, the big idea here is that as the model user, um, it really is your responsibility to um, to understand this stuff and to, to utilize your predictions responsibly uh, within this decision making process, uh, particularly with that that um, idea of of understanding and, and communicating uncertainty. So I'm just going to finish off here with a little bit of. Um, of a discussion about WFDS to kind of lead you into Rod Lin's talk about FireTech, which is uh, a very similar model um, in, in formulation to WFDS. Some, some very technical differences that I'm not going to get into. Um, but so, so WFDS is the model that, that uh, I primarily use in my research. Um, it's, a, it's an extension of a, a model developed by NIST for um, for fire spread and, and smoke transport inside of buildings. Um, and essentially it's it's been linked on top of this model to include the capability to model um, outdoor wind flows and then the, the thermal breakdown and, and gas phase combustion of uh, actual vegetation and wildland fuels. Um, so these two images here show you on the top is a, a model simulation from FDS um, modeling this, this fire inside of a building and um, you know, in this case, it's showing us how what the temperature is at, at a particular height in all of those rooms. Um, and so this model has been widely used for improving building safety and, and how can we construct buildings that are more uh, fire safe? Uh, you know, how many sprinklers do we need? Where do we need to put them? Um, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so this is a really, really commonly used model in the, the fire safety um, and, and sort of, you know, building construction world. Um, and then it's now been adapted to uh, to work in the wildland. So below there's just an example of a simulation of a, a spreading service fire um, moving into a forest and, and starting to torch out some of those crowns there. Um, so all these models are, are, are fully three-dimensional um, and they basically work uh, through linking an underlying uh, computational fluid dynamics model. Um, so this is a model that predicts fluid flows through, um, you know, through and around shapes, through porous media like a tree crown. Um, and then we go ahead and we link that, that CFD or computational fluid dynamics model with uh, separate models for uh, convection and radiation um, and then the thermal breakdown of, of vegetation and then, then how that vegetation is going to combust.
So in uh, WFDS, we have a really wide range of, of domains. So, so it's, you know, it's fully customizable uh, through, our, through our input files. We can build a domain um, you know, from several meters in size. You know, we could uh, recreate a lab experiment. You know, we could recreate one of Rothermel's pine needle experiments that, that, that happened um, you know, just on a lab bench. So, so several meters in size all the way up to, to larger scale wildfires um, with domains that are several kilometers in size. Um, and really the, the limitation there is, is our, our computational power. So, so how, uh, uh, how much RAM does our computer have? And um, basically how, how long are we willing to wait for the simulation to run? Um, and then the related issue is, is around resolution. Um, really the, the limitation on memory is, is about how many, how many voxels or how many three-dimensional pixels do we have. Um, so a resolution can, can be scaled from you know, centimeters all the way up to, to several meters. Um, not much further than that because as, as you make your resolution coarser, uh, we have to start basically glossing over more and more physical aspects of fire um, you know, you know, both the, the chemical and physical aspects that uh, kind of get washed out if, if you go too large of a, a resolution. Um, so within each of these three-dimensional pixels, um, we can represent the, the actual vegetation. Um, and, and so basically what we do is, um, you know, within that volume, we, we come up with, you know, the characteristic surface area to volume ratio, percent moisture, uh, heat of combustion, uh, the mass or, or the bulk density, how much fuel is, is there in that, that three-dimensional space, uh, what's the actual chemical composition of the fuels, what are the fuel shapes, um, and, and really a whole lot more to, to describe um, the fuels in any given location. Um, but we're, we're making some generalizations there. So this example is showing how we would take a Douglas fir and then break it down into uh, basically foliage and, and round wood being the like one hour, like likely only the one hour branch wood. Um, and then we can, we can come up with some uh, representative numbers and then distribute that fuel within each uh, three dimensional uh, pixel. So now I'm just going to show you some, some examples of, of a little bit of the, the validation and experimentation behind the model. And then just some examples of, of what the model outputs look like. Um, but in, in developing this model, uh, uh, Ruddy Mel, the, the Forest Service researcher um, who, uh, who developed the model as, as part of his, his PhD work, um, he uh, and, and others have been involved in a number of experiments to see how this model works uh, in terms of, you know, predicting combustion with different fuel arrangements. Um, so they've done some, some tree burn experiments where they've burned individual uh, Douglas fir, uh, actually just straight, you know, Christmas trees, basically from a Christmas tree farm uh, in the lab. Um, some examples of, of discontinuous fuel beds are really crown fuel beds um, on, on slopes. And then uh, some other experiments surrounding uh, crown fuel or, or crown ignition, right? How, how does fire spread from one fuel strata um, to the next? Um, and then this is just another uh, image of, of Ruddy's uh, uh, pine tree, or not, well, not pine tree, Douglas fir tree um, experiments and, and how the model uh, do, does a really good job of, of predicting um, the, the burnout time and the flame shape and um, the heat release rate and, and lots of different aspects of the fire behavior, um, which, which gives us some confidence in the, the actual physical basis for this model and that um, it, it, it does a, a good job of um, of representing combustion in, in, in three dimensions. And then these are just a couple of, of images that, that I made. Um, so on the left here is a, a figure that I made for a, a paper I'm involved in at the moment um, where we're using WFDS to compare uh, the, the impacts of, of a fuel hazard reduction treatment. So this is kind of a standard treatment following the guidelines uh, from AG and Skinner that we had talked about. Uh, versus a, a restoration treatment where um, the, the treatment prescription, you know, explicitly created a, a much more heterogeneous uh, forest structure that's uh, likely more representative of what our, our dry ponderosa forests looked like historically, you know, groups of trees, et cetera. And, 
so the model allows us to look at things like the potential shape of the fire line. So you can see in our restoration treatment, we've got a much more complex fire line. Um, there's more variability there in terms of the, the rate of heat release uh, versus our fuel hazard reduction, which is uh, because the trees are more uniform, the surface fuels are more uniform, uh, the winds are more uniform, which all leads to a more uniform fire line. Uh, and then our pretreatment, um, basically we've got a really uniform fuel bed because it was these are from the Black Hills, and I don't know if, if any of you have ever, ever been up in the Black Hills, um, but when we, uh, when there's no management action taken in those stands, there's a really, really large regeneration cohort that will establish, and, and so basically we have dense pine needle fuel beds throughout the whole stand, which gives us a really consistent straight fire line in, in our model, um, and then also that really high fuel load results in, in a fully developed um, crown fire. Um, and so that's represented, you can see the, the black circles mean that a, a tree was is, is predicted to have been killed by the fire. Um, and uh, actually, if you're interested, this fire on the left here is, is a, a probably a best described as a passive crown fire, um, even though basically every single tree there is getting torched out. Um, so there, there wasn't, there's not enough wind there. The fire is basically moving too slow to be... Um, an active crown fire, but it it's there's so much surface fuel that it's it's torching out every single tree as it moves along. Um, and then on the right there is just an example of how we can uh, even in the absence of fire, this model is really useful for understanding how our fuel treatments or, or forest restoration treatments are going to influence wind flows. Um, so that's kind of a contrived example there of if we went out into the forest and we just cut out a bunch of tree groups. So we're only leaving groups of nine trees. Um, and we end up with this really complex wind field um, with some really fast parts, some slower parts. Um, but but basically the model is, uh, you know, at its heart is is a wind model um, that we've then added some some combustion components on top of. Um, and so so it it models the wind through our our complex forest there, um, and and just just gives us some good insight on on how our treatments are going to affect um, affect the winds. And then finally, I thought this was kind of cool because uh, so Mark Finney is a uh, Forest Service researcher up in Missoula, um, and and for a while now he's really been been making this argument that we don't actually understand how fires spread physically, and um, he's actually more of an empirical guy who uh, thinks that we need to be doing you know all sorts of lab scale experiments to understand these physical processes. Um, and so he put out this paper about this this peak and trough behavior um, that he's observed in his laboratory fires and how those troughs in in between the flames are where uh, the heat transfer is able to occur because the wind can can push that convection or you know that that, that convective heat into the fuel bed um, and you know in, in his mind this is a uh, something we need to learn in the lab and I just find it interesting that that in one of my simulations here on the right um, right, this is just an emergent property of the model. It, it solves all the physical equations, and, and we get that exact same fire line behavior, um, and we can see all those same heat transfer processes. Uh, so it's just an example of, um, you know, how, how these models can help push forward our understanding of fire behavior and fire dynamics, um, even if we, you know, we never leave the the computer chip. Um, right, this is just a, a simulation, but um, you know, can can give us some insights about how uh, fires behave and spread, um, you know, e even in the absence of a, of a real fire. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave that there and, uh, ask you to, uh, to check out, uh, Rod Lynn's, uh, lecture that I've linked to on the Canvas page at, at, at some point this week. Um, I think he does a, a much better job than I do of, of talking about these models, these physical based models. And then how they, uh, you know, have, have some really strong impacts for our, our operational um, operational fire uh, tactics and, and understanding of behavior in the field. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there for you.